Part One. A man wants to place an order by telephone for some office stationery. First, you have some time to look at questions one to six. Thank you for calling Millennium Office Supplies. If you would like to place an order, please press one. Your call has been placed in a queue. A customer service operator will be with you shortly. Gina speaking. How can I help you? Oh, hello. I'd like to order some stationery, please. And who am I speaking to? John Carter. Right. Can I just confirm your account number and the name of your company, John? Sure. The account number is six nine two four double one. Six nine two four one one. Right. And you're from Rainbow Computers?、Uh, no, the company is Rainbow Communications. Oh, okay. I'll just fix that on the system. Communications. And what would you like to order, John?、Uh, envelopes. We need a box of A4. That is normal size envelopes. White, yellow, or Manila?、Um, we'll have the plain white, please.、Uh, but the ones with the little windows. Okay. One box A4 white. Just the one box, was it? Um. On second thoughts, make that two boxes. We go through heaps of envelopes. Um. As a matter of interest, are they made from recycled paper? No, you can't get white recycled paper. The recycled ones are grey, and they're more expensive, actually. Right, we'll stick to white then. Something else, John? Yes, we need some coloured photocopy paper. What colours do you have? We've got purple, light blue, blue, light green, whatever you want, pretty much. There are five hundred sheets to the pack. Right, let's see.、Um, we're going to need a lot of blue paper for our new price lists. So, can you give us ten packs, please? Make sure it's the light blue, though. Ten packs of the light blue. Look at questions. Anything else that we can help you with? Um,、uh, let me think. What else do we need?、Uh, oh, I'm sure there was something else. Pens, paper clips, fax paper, computer supplies, office furniture. Yeah, ah, oh yes, we need floppy disks. Do you have those nice coloured ones? Yes, but they're a bit more expensive than the black ones. Oh, that's all right. I'm not paying anyway. <laughs> right, floppy disks. And what about diaries for next year? We've got them in stock already, and it's a good idea to order early. Um, no, I think we're all right for diaries. But something we do need is one of those big wall calendars. You know, one that shows the whole year at a glance. Do you stock those? We certainly do. Okay, can you include a wall calendar then、uh, with the other stuff? Um, just make sure it's got the whole year on the one side. Sure. And do you have a copy of our new catalogue? No, I don't. But could you send one? Yes, I'll pop one in with the order. You'll find it a lot easier to remember what you need if you have our catalogue in front of you next time. Yes, good idea. And、um, when can you deliver this? Should be with you tomorrow morning. Can you make sure that it's not after eleven thirty a.m. because I have to go out at twelve? There's only myself here on Fridays. Fine. I'll make a note on the delivery docket that they should deliver before half past eleven. Thanks very much. Thanks. That is the end of part one.
You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. And you are going to hear a lecture. First, you have some time to look at questions. Good afternoon, everybody. It's Ronald Jaff with this week's edition of Movie Talk. First, let's look at the films this week in the theatre. The Kid Rides Again, When You Find Love, and Wronged. The last of the three, Wronged, is definitely the best. In fact, one of the best films in a long time, with Henry Michelson and Joanne Seymour. It is about a man who gets a life sentence for a murder he did not commit. In the style of the films of the 40s and 50s, it is a modern story of a man and his wife wonderfully played by Joanne Seymour. They fight to make people believe Thompson is the wrong man and not the killer. The strength of their love is wonderful even after Thompson has been in prison for 15 years. Of course, I won't tell you what happens after Thompson's 15th year in prison. That would ruin the story. But if you see no other film, you should see this one. The story may be old, but the acting is great and it will hold your attention from beginning to end. Unfortunately, I can't say the same for When You Find Love. Just another silly story about how boy meets girl, boy loses girl, boy gets girl again, and they live happily ever after. Hollywood ever get tired of such stupid films? Yet, on a New England college campus, the star of the movie, Tommy Seal, is a freshman. He meets the two years older Stephanie Fool, played by Sally Evans. In real life, she must be at least 30, not 20. Well. Billy, our hero, has had a hard time with Stephanie. After all, he is so much younger. But they fall in love in about a minute, as long as it takes to take a picture with a Polaroid. And they are both so happy, in true paradise, until, that is, until Buck, the star football player, played by Ronco Starr, the only good acting in the film, steals Stephanie away from the poor Billy. He is, after all, a senior and football star. And the rest of the film is about, naturally, how Billy gets Stephanie back, making her remember their love. He shows her that he, not Buck, is the man for her. Well, if you can stand a stupid story and bad acting, then take your eight-year-old child to see When You Find Love. Anyone older will leave the theatre before the movie ends. And finally, The Kid Rides Again, a western about a young cowboy, Kit Barnes, who stops the bad guys, the robbers, the killers, and plain old bullies, and helps the good guys. Kit is fast with a gun and never once in this cowboy. Kit is the cowboy who never stays in one place for a very long time, who leads a lonely but very free life. Nothing new on the storyline, but a good classic style western with good acting. Peter Sells as Kit catches just the right mood. He's an excellent and natural cowboy. There are beautiful scenes of the open country in the west and enough action to hold your interest. A good cowboy film for those who, like me, always enjoy seeing the old west. And now, before we go on with the news from Hollywood, a word from our sponsor. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You'll hear an interview with a wildlife specialist called Alison Sharp talking about bears. In the first part of the discussion, they are talking about the history of the bear. First, look at questions 21 
to 23. Alison Sharp has spent much of her life researching bears, and in particular, bears in danger of extinction. She is the author of a recent book on bears, and we welcome her to the studio today. Thank you. Delighted to be here. First of all, can you give us a quick overview of the history of the bear family? Well, the bears we know today actually have as their ancestors bears which have been evolving for some 40 million years. We have fossils of the earliest true bear, and it's important to emphasize this because some creatures are called bears but are not. Such as koalas, for instance. <laughs> yes, exactly. Fossils of the true bear show a small dog-sized animal with characteristics that show a blending of dog and bear traits. So the general belief is that dogs and bears were of the same family? Yes, that's the theory. And then we see the arrival of the early cave bear. We know from cave drawings that Neanderthal man used to worship this bear and at the same time fear it. Understandable, perhaps. Uh, yes, but they need not have worried because the cave bear only ate plants. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, the cave bear survived two ice ages, but then became extinct. In the second part of the interview, Alison talks more about the situation of bears today. Look at questions 24 to 30. So, how many bears can we find today? And are any of them in danger of extinction? Well, I'll answer your first question first. There are eight species of bear in all, among them the American black bear and the brown bear, from which evolved the newest species of bear, the polar bear. So, how old is the polar bear? Oh, he's a relative newcomer, just 20,000 years old. And... Could you tell us a little about them? Which is the largest bear, for instance? Well, the largest bear existing today is either the polar bear or the brown bear. Right. Don't we know? <laughs> well, it depends which criteria you use. The polar bear is the heaviest. The male weighs up to 1,500 pounds, but his narrow body actually makes him look smaller than the much more robust brown bear. So the brown bear appears the biggest? Yes. And the smallest? Well, the sun bear is the smallest of the eight species. They only weigh between 60 and 145 pounds. That makes him a comparative junior. <laughs> yes. And then next we have the so-called giant panda. But that's a small bear too, comparatively speaking. And are all bears meat eaters? No, not at all. In fact, the giant panda is almost entirely herbivorous, living on a diet of 30 types of bamboo. Oh, yes, of course. Pandas are famous for that. <laughs> and another interesting bear is the sloth bear, which eats insects, particularly termites. Mm. He can turn his mouth into a tube and suck the insects out of their nests. So, going back to my second question, mm -hmm. are bears really in danger of extinction? Yes, indeed, they are. The sun bear in particular, as they've been hunted almost out of existence. And the habitat of the panda is also being reduced on a daily basis. Can anything be done to reduce the threat to these endangered species? 
I know, for instance, that it's very hard to breed bears in captivity. Yes. Well, I think that by raising people's awareness generally, we can reduce conflict between humans and animals, to stop the slaughter in parts of the world where bears are still hunted, supposedly in self-defense or to protect livestock, but often quite unnecessarily. And we can also encourage governments to preserve the natural environment of the bear, rather than allow the areas where they live to be systematically destroyed in the name of progress. Yes, of course. And in addition to these global efforts, all profits from the sale of my book will go toward the United Nations Bear Protection Program. That's wonderful. And with the news coming up, thank you for your time, Alison, and best of luck with the book. Thank you very much. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear part of a lecture on the current and future use of mobile phones. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Okay, now today we're looking at changes in communication, and specifically changes that have just happened or are likely to happen in the next few years. Key to this is the mobile phone, which is increasingly being seen as an all-purpose system rather than just a phone. If you only use your phone for texting and making calls now, you will be amazed at how you'll be using it in the future. The technology has been developed for a range of other uses. For example, phones could be used so that if you are meeting someone and they get lost, you could send them a map of your location to help them. This will save all those complicated explanations over the phone and our poor friends or colleagues trying to drive and find out where they are at the same time. And if you get bored waiting, or if you're traveling, for example, you will soon be able to see TV news on your phone as it is actually being broadcast. This means that you won't have to miss any of your favorites if you are away for a few days. Most people have got used to texting now, and young people send pictures to each other. But what is exciting is the possibility of putting music with them before you send them. And it's not all frivolous. Phones are going to become even more critical in business and education. Some recent developments have a highly practical usage. So, for example, as lecturers, we will be able to send everybody a text to let them know if lectures have been cancelled. And the new phones could have a further use in education, as well as business, as they will enable us to go to any destination, such as when we are doing a field trip, for instance, and from there to send data directly to a computer so that we can access it when we get home. This means we will no longer be limited by what the phone can store. And it's interesting to look at the different ways that men and women use phones now as that does affect how the technology will develop. Some research has been done on how people use phones and some of the results are surprising. One of the increasing usages of mobile phones is to get all sorts of data such as phone numbers, 
the weather, train times, etc. And while there's been an attempt to set up connections with things that women might be interested in accessing, it is overwhelmingly men who do this. But what about the traditional use of a phone? To speak to people? I suppose we would predict that it is mainly women who use phones as a method of contact for friends and family, but, in fact, the genders exploit this facility equally. I've spoken about the increased business usages that phones will offer, and I suppose we would associate this usage with men. The survey picked up, though, that women are often working from home, or catching up with work in the evenings, so they use phones in this way as much as men do. Most of us are aware we can store photos on our phones. It's an ideal method of capturing a moment wherever you are. Women tend to be the group that keep photos on their phones, but it seems that men use their phones to actually take pictures much more than women do. And, of course, all this knowledge affects the marketing that the companies will do in order to sell the That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.